Photo reconnaissance. It doesn't have the same high profile as the fighter mission, but recce missions require a high level of aircrew proficiency and can be just as challenging and exciting as any missions in tactical aviation. The F-14 Tomcat used the TARPS pod to perform reconnaissance for much of its career. And today, we're gonna to talk to two former F-14 Rios who are gonna give us insight into TARPS, the cameras, mission planning, and flying some high profile missions. We also have a limited duty officer, uh, also known as an LDO, who provides great information on the TARPS program and technical information about photo reconnaissance. And these guys are gonna cover the TARP story from start to finish. So here we go. Smile, you're on camera. Hey, welcome back to the F-14 TomCast. I'm Dave Baronic, call sign bio. I was an F-14 Rio and Top Gun instructor. And today we're going to talk about TARPs. When the U.S. Navy retired its RA-5 vigilantes in 1979 and RF-8 crusaders in 1982, deployed carriers and active duty air wings lost their indigenous reconnaissance capability. Now, the Navy Reserve operated RF-8s until 1987. Anyway, as they had for decades, commanders valued the tactical reconnaissance capability, and they wanted it to continue. Naval aviation leaders realized this and developed the TARP's potted reconnaissance system for the F-14 Tomcat. All right. And our three guests today were involved with various aspects of the TARP's program throughout the years. And we'll provide some exposure <laughs> little little pun there for the TARPS crowd uh, for this unique self-escort reconnaissance capability. So we have our uh, our three guests today uh, are arranged by height. Uh, we've got Dave Ruder Root. He was an F-14 Rio in the initial TARPS deployment. Al Kodak Tennyson, uh, who was uh, uh, the, the TARPS officer in several squadrons. And Mike Sanonol, F-14 Rio, who's going to talk about digital TARPS. So let's go through each one of our guests and just a uh, uh, nice introduction background of why they're the professional that they are. So let's start with Reuter. Uh, and from my, from my point of view, you're in the top right corner of the Hollywood squares today. So tell us, tell us, Reuter, uh, you know, where are you from, how you got commissioned, how you got into naval aviation, how you got into the F-14? Uh, I'm from the uh, San Francisco Bay Area is where I grew up, East Bay. I did my undergrad at Berkeley at the NROTC unit there. Most people don't realize that was one of the first NROTC units and its first CO was a guy named Chester W. Nimitz who retired in Berkeley and whose wife was still alive when I was a midshipman. So she'd come down and see us. Uh, out of that, I uh, went to flight school, mostly because my first class cruise was on a SSBN and they got off of that and they said, you wanna go nuke power or there's this flight school guarantee that was not a hard choice. You know, uh, in flight school, I was mentored by a F-4 Rio and ended up going West Coast at F-14s. Uh, so that was around 1980 is when I got to Miramar. My first flight in the Tomcat was in April 1980. I flew for over 13 years in the Tomcat straight. I have a bit over 3,000 flight hours in the F-14, and I have 850 traps. My class was the first class that was tapped for going TARPs at the time, so a bunch of us, and they took about half the class and sent them to the East Coast. Uh, we had a lot of A-5 and RF-8 guys at the RAG as instructors, and that's who developed the TARP syllabus about teaching about aerial reconnaissance. Uh, so I ended up in VF-211 with some noteworthy people like Al Tennyson, who was who I relied on for the technical knowledge. And I flew tarps my whole time in the Tomcat and uh, when I was on staff duty at ComFit and at the RAG, I was a tarps instructor uh, for a few times. So I had four fleet squadrons, a little unusual because one of them was VF-194 that only lasted a year. <laughs> 
From that, I got dumped back in the rag for a while until they found a squadron for me to go to, which was 213. And then out of uh, 213, I went to ComFit, where I was the TARPS officer, and then went off to BF-154 when they were uh, re-changing uh, bases to uh, at Sugi, Japan. And I did TARPS there. Excellent. Awesome. Hey, and uh, Kodak, how about you? What, uh, what's your background? How'd you uh, get into naval aviation, F-14s? What squadrons were you in? Okay. Uh, my name is Al Tennyson. I am from uh, Brooklyn, New York. I joined the Navy there at Floyd Bennett Field at uh, the age of 17. Uh, went to boot camp. My first ship was a USS Randolph, CBS 15 out of Norfolk. Uh, I got into the photo lab there. Uh, I, it's a long story, but anyway, I, I went, I worked on the flight deck as a blue shirt, V V1 division. I got transferred, luckily, uh, into uh, the photo lab. And uh, I thought I had no plans of staying in the Navy. I was uh, going to do my two-year reserve and get out and have a little hobby. Uh, well, after my two years, I decided, well, this ain't so bad, and decided to stick around. So I re-enlisted for orders to Hawaii, which was a great tour for me. Uh, I got there as a third class and left as a first class uh, in three years. So uh, very enjoyable. Then I got to go to my first photo school. All these other, I made third and second and first right out of the book. Uh, B school was good. They sent me to C school, which was electronic systems, which was the F8 uh, camera control system, basically. Went into the little of the RA3, but uh, but basically the RF8. Uh, so after that, I went to uh, VFP63, of course, out of Miramar. Uh, went into the camera repair section. Did a lot of work on the pan cameras there, and some of the still, but mostly the pan, panoramic cameras. Uh, in, let's see, I made chief in 76. I made, got my commission as an LDO in 78. And my skipper asked me, he said, hey, they're coming out with this system called TARPS. Uh, how would you like to, to get involved with that? And I said, well, it sounds interesting. So I uh, got orders after I went through the uh, commissioning school and down in Pensacola, got orders to come fit. There I was in the, the training department and we set up all the uh, training facilities and schedules for the enlisted classes. I helped develop the, the the number of PHs uh, that would go to each squadron. I had designated that the recon coordinator in each of the squadrons should be a warrant officer. Uh, at that time, unfortunately, uh, my detailer for the warrant LDOs, he intermixed as didn't mean anything to him who did what. So it never did really work out that we got warrants where they were supposed to be. Uh, anyway, after ComFit, here it comes now. TARPS hasn't hit the fleet yet. And they kept waiting and waiting and waiting. And see, 111 was supposed to be the first squadron, and I was supposed to go to it. And I said, okay. Then they said, oh, no, not so fast. We slipped that schedule. Uh, then 211 was going to be. And going to that, I said, okay, that's good. And he said, well, not so fast. VF-84 on the East Coast became the first deployable TARP squad. And I said, oh, my God, I can just, I'm going east. I don't want to go east. I got a call from a buddy of mine that was in the vigilantes, and he said, hey, what can you tell me about TARPs? And I said, why do you want to know? He says, well, because they're asking me to go to VF-84. And I said, I'll tell you what, if you go to VF-84, I'll tell you anything you want to know and more. <laughs> uh, so anyway, 
He went to VF84. I went to VF211. So I was in VF211 from 81 to 85. After that, doing doing tarps missions in uh, in VF211. Oh, well, yeah. The okay, got it. I was the I was the work center 240 branch officer. Yeah. Uh, later on, I became the Abwitz division officer, uh, and that's all during that tour. Uh, next, I went to Naval Air Systems Command. Was that and doing tarp stuff? The, d- yes, absolutely. I worked mm-hmm. for Jomo Thomas there, and uh, Dick Everett came in. He was he was my one of my skippers in two eleven. He also became the what they call the Air Five Forty Seven Czar. And uh, so he headed up the reconnaissance outfit there in, in Nav Air. So after that, they were looking to fill a billet out on the West Coast. There were some problems or some guy was leaving and everything. And the detailer, my detailer at that time, worked right across the hall from me. And he comes in and he says, hey, I need a guy to go to VF-211. I said, you're kidding me. He said, no, why? I said, I won't have to change the patch on my flight jacket. <laughs> so he said, you kidding me? I said, no. So he said, that's it. The coffee mug. that's it. You're gone. <laughs> so I went back to BF-211 in 85 to 88. And then I was the Abweb's division officer and became the AMO. Uh, so, so for all our that. listeners, the uh, you know we're a division officer is the the officer in charge of you know could be av- you know aviation weapons thing in avionics like, like three or four stations yeah yeah things like that. So we're probably talking somewhere around 50, 60 sailors. And when you mentioned AMO, that's the assistant maintenance officer who's in charge of the administrative functions of the maintenance department. So please continue. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right. We're just doing that for everybody so they know. All right, keep going. So. Uh, I've been around tarps since it first hit the fleet, basically. Uh, I did the oppy valves. I did the film processing on the oppy valves up at Point Magoo. I did the maintenance verification uh, tests uh, where we put up the guys did the maintenance and we timed it and, and, and did all make sure everything, all the... T's were crossed, the I's were dotted, uh, things like that. So, been with tarps basically the whole time. Uh, All right. Well, great. And then, uh, Santa, how about you? I'm a little intimidated by all of Kodak's experience in tarps there, but uh, I didn't have quite so it's such a long run. But I uh, grew up in a suburb of Milwaukee, uh, soloed when I was 17, wanted to, wanted to go fly, did not uh, – did not have an aviation family, so I uh, didn't really know. I wanted to go to the Air Force. And then uh, senior year in high school, uh, one of my friend's older brothers was uh, BN, going through BN school in Pensacola. So our parents let us uh, pile in one of the station wagons, and four of us knuckleheads went down to Pensacola for a week and uh, lived uh, slept on these guys' couch. And uh, uh, that's where I changed to the Navy. It was uh, They took us to the old club for brunch. Took us to Pensacola Beach. You're watching T-34s go over your head uh, all day long. I'm like, wow, this, this seems pretty cool. So I went back, and I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do for college, and I wasn't real motivated in high school, so the academy wasn't an option. ROTC scholarship wasn't an option. So, uh, But they had this thing called college program, which you just uh, went to ROTC without a scholarship, You know, wore the uniform, did all that stuff, didn't get any money. Uh, and then I, I picked up a two-year scholarship and uh, then went off to flight school. Um, I got to uh, VT-10. And uh, when we checked in, Commander Jensen, I can remember his name, a, a skipper of uh, VT-10, said, uh, anybody that graduates Commodore's list is going to get his first choice. So I thought, well, that's a pretty good deal. And we uh, went through the school and we got to the end and there was no F-14 slots. And the A6 was going away. I, I don't think they even had an A6 slot. So it was either S3s or A6Bs. And then me and my friend, Fred Sanford, who uh, we both graduated Commodore's list with distinction, top 5%. So we went up to Commander Jensen's office. We said, hey, is there any, you know, are you going to make good on this little promise? And uh, amazingly, he did. He generated two slots for us. And uh, so I went to F14s. And uh, I just did uh, one tour in Tomcats. Uh, about 235 traps and uh, did not make a thousand hours. 
sadly. But I do think I'm the only guest so far that has the distinction of flying with uh, one of the two TomCast hosts, Crunch. <laughs> <laughs> That's, we, yes sir that is correct we, yeah we flew i looked at my log book we flew about five times uh, off the teddy roosevelt i think all of them yeah and uh so i did a, a tour in bf-32 and then i went to the training command and and uh i got out of the navy so that yeah and uh, excellent. Yeah, that's right. And so um, it, we, you and I did not get a chance to fly together that much and for everybody else. Uh, so Santa was a little bit ahead of me by about two years, I think, or so, whatever it was. My, my Nugget tour, my first cruise was your second, right? Yep. 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 And so, uh, you know, you were, he was the experienced mission commander taking us in country and I'm the, the new guy who he's just trying to keep off the ramp. So that's what, that's what we were doing. Is that about okay. right? Is that's that how right. you remember it? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure you were super capable. I just, I was doing a lot of digital tarps is what I pretty much did once that program kicked off. So, uh, that was kind of what I was doing. That's yeah. why you're here, man. Okay, yeah. so if we're talking about ancient connections, Ruder and I were in sister squadrons way back in uh, 19... Uh, I got to VF-24 in 1981, and you'd been in VF-211 probably a few months longer than that. Than, you know. I, I got there in early 81, late yeah. 80 or early 81. I was looking at my logbook, and so, it. I mean, we made the uh, cruise on the Constellation and then the one on the Ranger. Yeah, so Ruder and I deployed together twice, uh, Constellation and Ranger in the early 80s. So when you awesome. guys were still in... Uh, diapers or whatever <laughs> okay let's okay let's move on <laughs> yeah by throw that shit out and then move right. on. <laughs> i might go get a coffee while you guys keep yeah. talking <laughs> <laughs> hey kodak yeah uh, let's let's lay down some <laughs> crunch man i can't get away with anything um, kodak tell us what does tarps stand for and if if you can I mean, how did the program come about? And talk about some of the uh, the sensors and the cameras that were at least in there in the start. Okay, sure thing. Okay, TARPS, Tactical Airborne Reconnaissance Pod System. Okay. Uh, 207 inches long, 1,760 pounds, non-jettisonable. When you had a problem in the pod, and you can ask Ruder <laughs> about the ECS problem we had, uh, yeah, you, you kind of wished it was jettisonable, but it wasn't. So, and, and thankfully, <clears throat> the quite great expense went into this development and, and outfitting it. And it was an interim system. People can't believe this was a system that was supposed to be around for five years. And then what was it going to be replaced by? Uh, the RF-18. All right. There's an idea. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. So this system, was, like I said, and all the support facilities then were, again, five years. A lot of these things weren't in the regular supply system. They were backed by uh, Naval Air Development Center Warminster built four production pods. Actually, I think there were six, but four production pods for the fleet to use for opavals. Uh, and we took three of them on a uh, debt to Hawaii uh, on a Connie. Uh, Ruder and I. Uh, so, I think five years. This thing lasted until 2006. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's amazing. 25 years. You know. Yeah. So, where did the cameras come from? Okay. The cameras were all sensors. Well, I say all. KS87 cameras went in the nose cone. So it that's a forward-looking visual. It was a, either a vertical or a forward oblique. You uh, you could do change that in flight. In bay two is the KA-99, which was the sensor that the pod was developed around. It is a nine-inch focal length panoramic camera. Now, I have seen something in literature where it said 
it rotated left and right. No, the camera did not rotate left and right. The camera stayed stationary. The mirror in the camera rotated, circular, and the film went the opposite way. It was a hell of a device. This system could go eight frames a second. Now you say, well, eight frames a second, that's not too bad, except each frame was 30 inches long. A physical film. Absolutely. Five inch wide, 30 inches long, eight times a second. This thing was flying through. And we had to tell the Rios in the beginning, and, and I had one in my squad, and I won't mention his name. We, <laughs> when, you, when you test it on deck, uh, you, you test it for a, a cycle or two. You don't put it on and forget about it because in 90 seconds, you're done. 2,000 foot of film will have traveled through that camera. <laughs> I'm sure that's never happened. Yeah. Uh, no, it, I, I'm saying it did. I, I had one guy and he only did it once. I had a little talk with him and he never did it again. <laughs> but okay, so that's that. That was an excellent camera. I'm wondering if it's me, Al, and I just forgot about it. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> no. <laughs> he wouldn't uh, let you get away with that, Ruder. No, no. Uh, Bay 3 was the infrared sensor made by Honeywell, the ANAAD-5. Very nice sensor. Uh, basically, uh, all electronic it took imagery, infrared imagery from the ground, converted it to electrical energy in the in its recorder and receiver. Uh, the recorder then passed film over a CRT, and that's how that image came. We, we used radar recording film in that sensor. Uh, mm -hmm. It, it, we used it as a mission trace. It was a beautiful sensor for that. What, what is and, explain what that explain what that means? What is a mission trace? A mission trace is you could start that camera in the beginning of your run and leave it on. It would, I mean the 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 speed of this. It, it really, I mean, inches per second. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, so it really didn't uh, use a lot of film. I only had a 250 foot capability. Uh, but that helped you in the post flight when you were developing and trying to figure out where everything was, because now yeah, you had the whole the trace. I, the the ISs didn't do, it did that. I, I didn't do that. I was in well, charge of with them. the processing. Yeah. But uh, after that, uh, hey, all hands were off. Yeah. <laughs> My hands were off. Yeah. <laughs> So, okay, so those were the three sensors. <clears throat> Later on, we decided we needed a standoff capability. That nine inch pan uh, didn't do the trick. So they came out, we had the KS-153s. Now it went in bay two instead of the 99. It could also, it then could be rotatable. It could do vertical. It could do left oblique. It could do right oblique. Most of the time, you wanted to do left oblique because if you were flying with tanks, the left was further away. Good point, because the, the pod was on the right side away. of the jet. So, yeah. Yeah, so you could get a better, uh, a little better angle. Okay, you could go out a little further. Otherwise, on the right side, the starboard tank cut off a lot of that view. Okay. Then they decided, hey, we need a little more. So they dug out the KS nine KA ninety three. Uh, this was this the KA ninety three was a Chicago aerial sensor or camera, just like the uh, KS eighty seven. Thirty six inch focal length. Oh. Now it mounted. You couldn't rotate this baby. This was put in, and and that was it. You could either put it in left, you could put it in right, and there again, you wanted to put it in left, oblique. Uh, and then it didn't rotate. 
And what was it? Which camera was that? That was the KA ninety three. The KA ninety three, which replaced the middle camera, the one fifty three, the KA ninety nine. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, but uh, yeah, we only had two of them. <laughs> well, well, when I say replace, I mean in the pod where it was installed. Oh, it yes, replaced. yeah, it went in bay two. Yeah. Same thing. The one fifty three. Replace the the ninety nine and mean the, the Navy only right. had two K ninety three cameras. That is correct. Awesome. They cross decked them babies all over. Wow. They, I don't remember ever flying with those. Santa, did we ever fly with those? You know better no, than I do. We not, not that I remember. And I don't even remember flying with the IR camera. I thought we were mostly KS one fifty three. Um, that we didn't use that much. I mean, we were primarily looking at the uh, panoramic camera. Okay. We, you said we you didn't. All our, our target. You don't remember the IR camera? I, I, I'm. Sure it might have been installed, but I remember having that KS oh, yeah, no, it, three in there. It was Bay three. It was always there. Oh yeah. It well, never left. It came out for anything. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. And it had other uses besides mission trace that was valuable that people didn't well, realize. I mean, you could get imagery if you were going over. You wanted to see if something was hot. That's what this IR sensor did. It could pick out difference in in temperatures. So if you would go in an electric plant, coal power plant, something, heat stacks, I mean, it would show you which are hot and which are cold. Yeah, I see the value in it. I just never remember carrying it, looking, yeah. at, you know, looking at targets post-mission. Yeah, well, they, they used it most, and you didn't get, probably, you never got a picture passed around the ready room uh, of an IR image. <laughs> you know, they they passed around pan imagery. They passed around uh, still photos from the from the either one of the one fifty threes or the or the KS eighty seven. But yeah, you you didn't get passed around the IR. You know, we'll we'll pull up a uh, an IR image example from uh, the internet and put okay, it on the yeah. video and Good. put oh, it on. You know, while we're talking that right over. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and that sensor. I mean, especially if you were at low altitude. Narrow field of view. It was amazing the detail you could get. You could almost some of those pictures. It looked like a photograph instead of an infrared imagery. Yeah, it it was beautiful sensor. Yeah, we we used it to uh, tell what sort of aircraft had been on a ramp. Because the aircraft, when they were sitting there, it was shaded underneath where the rest of the ramp was hot. So you could actually tell if it was an F-4 or an F-14 that had been sitting there on the ramp. Yep. And the other thing that we used it for, people didn't realize, is that if you had tanks, of whether petroleum or uh, water liquid, is the tank would have different temperatures depending on what the level of the liquid was. So we could yeah. tell if a tank was empty or if it was half full or uh, partially full. Absolutely that's, correct. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a great point. So, um, so Ritter, you know, uh, it, it, great, great discussion here. So going, going back, you were in that first fleet TARP squadron, right? Yeah. So how, how did you get, how did you get involved in the TARPS mission? I mean, were you selected for that or is that something that everybody did? How'd that work in your squadron? There was a lot of involuntary selections. <laughs> There, there was a feeling around the Tomcat community, and some of it came from the regular F-8 guys, that all the Tomcat should be doing is fighter missions. And so they took about half of my rag class, uh, the guys who had some experience and some who didn't, and they said, you guys are all going TARPs because we have the first deployments going out on the East Coast and going on the West Coast. And so guys that I went through the rag with is, you know, uh, half a dozen of them went through the TARPS training and they ended up going East Coast. And then there was some of us uh, that ended up going West Coast. Some of them were obvious choices because we had uh, uh, RA5C, uh, you know, backseaters, what they call them, RANs, uh, guys like Chris Christensen. Whose uh, call sign was... VC okay. for, for Vicky yeah, Clown. For Vicky, yeah. <laughs> and, and we had Mike Kramer, who was a RF-8 guy. Mm -hmm. And so he came in. And then otherwise, we had uh, Kevin Saxon, who was a uh, SIR grad out of the training command. Uh, Matt Laskowski, myself. Uh, I was trying to remember some of the others talking to Al and, and going back and looking through my book. Uh, effectively, once we got to the fleet, you you weren't just set with TARPS guys unless it was a very important mission is we cross-pollinated a lot. 
So I got selected. Uh, it was about 20 more flights in the RAG at the time. That was how the syllabus was set up. Uh, there was classroom study to understand uh, film and you know photography, uh, things like why you use different colored uh, filters, uh, about what resolution is. That was something that you know people say that, but what do they really mean? And what it meant to us was how uh, far apart two objects could be before you could tell they were two art, uh, objects. And so that was all a uh, factor of the type of film you were using, the focal length of the camera, and how far away you were. And so what made it different than the regular fighter guys is that more went into mission planning. You just didn't kick the tires and strap in and light the fires and go off and take pictures. A lot of times you had to look at things like the time of day. So which is things people didn't look at, and also the time of day is you you know you didn't want to be taking pictures with the sun looking down the uh, uh, camera. Uh, as Al said, we would normally practice when we were doing oblique photos, mostly with the KA-99 at first, and uh, out the left side. And so the biggest thing we didn't have in the F-14 was a viewfinder. But you had to basically estimate where the camera was looking by looking over the nose or looking over the uh, rail of the canopy. And so I remember the rail of the canopy, if I stood up straight, and I'm 6'2", is that was about 45 degree oblique. And I would go up like about a, you know, a handful, and I had a grease pencil, and I would mark that on the canopy, and that was 30 degrees. Mm -hmm. and, and that was stuff that we learned from the older guys, too. The A5 guys had a viewfinder. But if you ever looked at the picture of an A5 vigilante, they were in the back with little tiny windows. You know, we were still a fighter. Yeah. <clears throat> And we were still a fighter. So that was one of those problems we had at first is you don't want to go over bad guy country and not have your area radar working. But in TARPS mode, the radar would depress and it would give you a uh, above ground measurement, which was estimated. And mm -hmm. otherwise, I'm trying to remember where the uh, above ground came from. If we had to input that, Al, or did that come from the radar altimeter? I don't remember. I think it came from the from the radar altimeter. Okay, that, you know, so you had to be careful of that because you got up too high and the radar altimeter was useless. So we had to uh, uh, plan that stuff. And so a little bit more went into planning, especially if you were doing a low level, is uh, I was trained to don't trust the guy who left all the markings on the charts. <laughs> so so I yeah. did a lot of, uh, you know, maps or charts for the flights to make sure we had them. Uh, so you went in and it, it was closer to the bombing guys. You'd have a initial point that you would fly to, and then you would, uh, we would even mark cameras on and cameras off, especially for the KA-99 because it whipped through the film so bad. But, yeah. Uh, so you so, had, uh, you had 20, well, one about making your own charts. I mean, that's a great way to get familiarization for the, the mission. So yeah. You know, you, you really don't want to take somebody else's chart or, you know, anyway. Well, I mean, sometimes for guys who were doing combat over Lebanon, they had to because the uh, uh, tempo was so fast that they said, OK, we're going to fly this same route, which is sort of like from lessons learned from Vietnam is dumb. Got it. I mean, one of the guys that we had uh, in the rag with us was Paul Ringwood. He yeah. flew RF-8s in Vietnam and he was shot down flying RF-8s, but he was rescued. But he, you know, they were flying against uh, I don't know, what was it called, the Dragon's Tooth, a bridge up in North Vietnam. Dragon's Jaw, they, yeah, yeah, drag, yeah. They tried for years to drop it, and then they'd send in the recce guy, usually an hour exactly after they dropped the bombs. And guess who's waiting for you? And they're all pissed off because you dropped bombs on them. And so, uh, you know, that was sort of the lessons we learned uh, for doing that. You know, you can't go in and right afterwards after they drop bombs and do. BDA, because, bomb damage assessment, because all this stuff's up in the air. Yep. So your rag syllabus was about 20 flights. So Santa, you, and that was in the early 80s. Santa, you came along in the 90s. How much training did you get for TARPs? I, I got zero training in the rag. Uh, okay. I came out and my, yeah, my first pilot was a, uh, uh, Pat Hags Haggerty was a big reconnaissance guy. And uh, I just started applying missions with him and helping him with planning and uh, that's what I learned. We were, we are we never did a lot of low level tarps because what I think Ruder's talking about with the charts, um, we were limited to ten thousand feet AGL in country, and that we were both 
doing Southern Watch in Bosnia, both of my cruises, and doing a lot of you know real world tarps out there, and it was all above ten thousand feet. Uh, but yeah, we were just learned on the learned on the fly, uh, learned on my first cruise. The, the syllabus was compressed later on when I was a rag instructor and I was one of the tarps instructors, and it was down to twelve. Yeah, five, that's what I got when I came through. Classroom. When I came through in '88, I, were you in the rag in '88? You might have been there. Yeah, yeah, I, I was. I, I was in the through. rag when I went through Top Gun, and you picked on me in Top Gun, and then you came to the rag, so I got to get payback. So. <laughs> Thanks, brother. <laughs> Buddy's only half a word. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember, I, I remember the TARPS training. So, Santa, you missed some good training. I mean, it's too bad they did that because the uh, – I mean, the classroom was one. And like Reuter said, they told you all this great technical stuff. But we got a dozen extra flights, and they were great flights uh, back then. And as an instructor, you name a low-level route in Southern California and Arizona and Nevada, and I flew it a lot. I flew a lot yeah. of them to the point where I almost didn't need a chart. Yeah. <laughs> so, and people are going, "Have you done this before?" Yeah, a few times. <laughs> okay, well, let's so let's let's segue into that. So, Santa, you're going to come up next, but Ruder, give us a, a, an abridged version of how you would prepare for a tarps flight, and then when you get in the flight, you know, camera on, camera off, next turn, and all that. Can you run through that in, uh, in just a couple uh, of moments? Well, part of it is if you had the intel, especially like for Southern Watch, or uh, I remember uh, flying the first sorties in there, was you had to ask, what are you looking for? Because that would determine what sort of distance you wanted, the resolution, what sort of camera, and so on. You know, and, and what are you looking for? And because of the uh, cyclic nature on the ship, you couldn't always get the best time of day, but that would sort of change where you were going to fly. So you could try to get the sun behind you as you were doing it. So I would do that. Uh, Southern Watch, we didn't use because of the altitude limits. Uh, Santa was saying is, you know, we didn't have to use charts. You were going point to point. We actually had early GPS then, <laughs> which made it nice. And, and I'm talking the 90 to 93 time frame when I was in VF 154 uh, it was different. And so, but if I was doing one ashore and, you know, you'd have to give yourself more time for the brief. So you go over the chart and you really want to know the chart well enough that that's not what you're relying on, that you should remember it and you're looking outside. And so that was uh, part of the mission. So that uh, talked to the, photo officer of, uh, you know, what sort of film are you loading and, you know, what sort of filters are you putting on? Are there any issues with that? And so that was the uh, extra planning that was on there. Uh, when I was a safety officer and later operations is I didn't like to be uh, uh, the guys to be handed charts that, you know, were set up with uh, plastic on them. So you just use a grease pencil because they weren't learning how to plan the flight. They weren't learning about, you know, what's the better IP. They were just trusting somebody else's judgment. And I go, that's great when you're flying the same route again and again. But if you're going to fly this over Indian country, as we called it, and by the way, part of my background is uh, one of my relatives is a Native American. So I can say that without getting in trouble. <laughs> and he was in the Navy, too. So that was my grandfather. Uh, that, uh, you know, so you, you put more planning into it that way. And then in the uh, in the air, it took an incredible amount of coordination between the pilot and the Rio. Yeah, you, especially to get the cameras lined up and where you were. But once you got used to flying with somebody, like when I was in VF-211 uh, with Kevin Saxon, uh, we flew a lot together and uh, doing a lot of tarps together. Same thing with Mike Kramer. Yeah. Yeah, Mike Kramer was pretty good because he flew RF-8. So he understood this whole thing about placement and so on. Uh, we would even to take care of the tank problem is we would sometimes fly like we flew down the, a Soviet ship and we rolled so it would free up so you could see everything. So, you know, as you're watching the little ADGM 30s track you as you're flying down the ship. So you know, that was their failing system at the time. OK, so we will get to that story. But while we're talking <laughs> about, you know, the uh, a little bit of mission planning and execution, Santa, what was it like uh Later on, when you came along in digital charts, uh, well, digital is completely different. I, if you don't, I don't want to go into that. Um, we were, I, we didn't do a lot of low levels, and I, I think the uh, part of it was 
when we were at my era, it was Lantern Pod, uh, FAC A. There were so many different missions we were doing. And we weren't allowed to go below 10,000 feet in country, except for a couple of times. I did do a mission below below 1,000 feet in uh, Bosnia, but it was mostly high altitude tarps. So uh, the navigation workload that you have in a low level environment, we just we just didn't do it that very, very often. And if we were doing low levels, it was usually low levels to uh, you know down to Dare County to drop bombs. Um, we didn't do a lot of low level tarps in my era. Um, the digital tarps. Uh, I feel like that's completely different. You know, we took out the uh, the camera in uh, KS the uh, KS eighty seven in the Bay One. They stripped that out of there and they just put a uh, digital Polnix camera in there. And uh, you got to remember, it's ninety five, so there wasn't really digital photography out yet. Nineteen ninety five, not any kind of ninety five camera. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah, nineteen ninety five. I mean, you go to the mall and you'd uh, see a digital camera. And take a picture and you put a picture of your kid on a coffee mug. And that was pretty much the technology we were dealing with. This Polnix camera put a couple of uh, uh, different uh, lenses on it. What is and, what's it uh, called? A Polnix camera. That was just a brand name. Just a digital cam- Man, I don't even remember that that detail. But I, I flew a digital tarp some, but I don't remember that. Oh, you did? Yeah. Spell that. Uh, P-U-L-N-I-X. All right. Polnix. We'll look that yeah. up. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And, uh, you would just, uh, you'd select your lens before the flight. We only had two of them. And, um, we, uh, we, uh, our squadron VF 32 did all the design implementation testing on it, uh, of the system. And, uh, we just used settings that was from the regular, the regular controls for the Rio and which anything that had KS 87, we just spliced into that. And we used those controls you could call up the uh, video that actually the Polnix camera was seeing and it would come on the P tit in the back, uh, the big, this big round display in the Rio's uh, area. And then up in the front, the pilot would see it. And this is where it, the field of view is extremely narrow, very narrow. And we set a limit of no lower than 10,000 feet for this camera due to the narrow field of view. Uh, why we didn't play around with wild, wider field of view cameras, I'm not sure. I don't remember. But uh, the hard part and, and the part that uh, was extremely difficult to use is the the camera was fixed. So the pilot would have to fly the target into the field, the very narrow field of view, and then the Rio would snap the picture. And uh, then they would the snap picture would appear on our screens and then you could decide if you wanted to transmit it off or not. Um, so it was supposed to be a proof of concept demonstrator. I, I, I think in theory at the time, it wasn't really designed for it to go out to the fleet and say, this is a great thing because it was very difficult to use. Uh, Crunch, did you, you flew some digital tarps, didn't you? I did. And, and as you talk about it, I remember you, cause uh, you know, my display in the front was a lot smaller. Right. Because I, it was on the HSD, which is what, six inches by nine inches or so. And it's down there between your legs behind the stick. Right. And so you're looking down at this thing, trying to line it up. And as you said, you got to fly over the target and you and I'd be sitting there and you're like, hey, here it is. And I don't see it. And so the only way to find it was to wag your wings. And so you'd be sitting there wagging your wings, hoping that you would fly over this thing. And be like, oh, there it is. And then you'd 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 lock your wings and kick some top rudder and snap a picture or something. I mean, I remember having a. It was like looking through a soda straw. It was Jesus. really hard. Santa, what year was that? So that was ninety five. Uh, kind of how I got into it was kind of I think an interesting story. Um, they uh, they came up with the idea. And then they had this digital con- digital tarps planning conference in dc and they wanted a guy from our squadron to go that had a lot of tarps experience um, i just came back from my first cruise uh, 10 of jg and that was back in the clinton era 95 when they shut down the government for a couple weeks and they weren't going to give him a hotel or give him a rental car or anything to go up there so he said i'm not going to go and i i think i was sitting around the ready room when this conversation went on i said well I'll go up there. My, my uh, aunt and uncle live in Alexandria, Virginia. I'll go. So uh, I drove up there and uh, I show up for this digital tarps planning meeting. And the sole purpose of, the, of this meeting was to get uh, fleet input on the digital tarp system. And uh, I get into this room. There's about 20 people around this big table. 
and uh, engineers all flown in for this to get fleet input. And uh, it was me. I'm the fleet input, uh, 25 year old, you know, Lieutenant JG. So uh, I think it started off and they were kind of looking around like, uh, should we even do this or not? Uh, but they kind of rolled it out and I told them what I thought about it. And they, uh, they, they said, all right. And they asked me to help uh, with a guy that was writing a test plan for the system. So I did that. He wasn't, uh, I really wasn't liking the direction he was going. He hadn't done any tarps. So uh, me and a guy from our squadron, uh, Dave Bizalon Biz, uh, was a test pilot at Rio. Um, he helped me write the test plan. So we wrote a, a developmental test plan for it, submitted it. And uh, PMA 241 said, yeah, let's do yours. And uh, so as kind of, so they, uh, they just gave it to us. The engineers showed up and it was uh, our IWT guys, you know, me. Um, our, IWT uh, integrated weapons team. Yeah. Integrated weapons team and the uh, IW, uh, the uh, tarps guys. And we're all trying to figure out how to wire this thing into the airplane. And uh, it, it was, it was the first time I really understood why we had trouble tuning missiles and stuff like that. I'm a mostly an F-14A guy we're pulling these uh, wire bundles out and they're just, you know, the coating on all the wires is not looking that great. And we're trying to find wires that'll actually connect places. So, uh, but we, we did that all in house, uh, which is kind of what they did with uh, lantern, I think, which. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yes. And we, we got yeah, a lantern lantern story coming up, a lantern episode coming up. So yeah, and that'd be great. And that, that kind of paved the way for this was a fleet operational eval where we did it all in house. Um, we did the D t- developmental testing and then we operationally tested it in Fallon and then we took it on its first cruise and we developed the whole thing, went from kind of concept to strapping it on the airplane and, uh, and tested it in six months. Um, but the, uh, nice job. Yeah, it was, it was a great, uh, win for our squadron. The, uh, the thing, the capability, I think that was really impressive, which was not the, you know, digital, pictures that we were taking, although they were, you know, nice resolution, it was the ability to t- transmit it off the airplane. So, uh, you know, we're flying over targets and I remember taking out to Fallon, the seals are attacking a building and we're just overhead and we're just giving them, you know, every five minutes we're rolling in, taking a picture and then transmitting it to a ground based station. And there they can upload it to, you know, all the Intel stuff and have it pretty much all over the world, you know, as yep. you're still flying. Yep. Rich. How were we transmitting that? I don't remember. Was that with Rover or was that, I, I, how no. did we transmit it? No, no, this was, this was a, uh, uh, you know, a hatchet job kind of, we were using, I think the mode four, something in the mode four would allow it to do some sort of handshake with the ground based receiving station. So we were just taking, you know, single images and transmitting them and it would, uh, it took a just, while you know, to transmit. It took a long time. It took, you know, two minutes an image. But and, it worked. Uh, it, it did work. And at the time, I mean, it, it was, re- it was, everybody was extremely excited about this. You know, the people in Pentagon could be getting an image for an F-14 that's flying over in country. Well, Sam, um, I'm glad so you talked, you talked about that transmitting because we used, uh, when I was in 211 in uh, 97, 98, flying Southern Watch, we used digital tarps and all the time and it worked. So yeah. I mean, we also we, use uh, regular, we also use regular film tarps, but we had some digital. And that's what we did. We flew it with uh, digital on day one, and then we still use our, you know, the the other sensors as we were flying. But uh, you know, if they primarily wanted to get the images while we were flying, that was that was what we were doing. And you know, it was supposed to be a proof of concept. That's what I, I feel bad as a guy that was involved in it that the fleet got it because I'm sure most of the guys the fleet went. What the heck are we doing? Oh, no. <laughs> this is impossible. That was fine. <laughs> I'm like, it's a proof of concept. It wasn't supposed to go out to the fleet. But I was fine. Okay. One more thing. Um, Crunch, let me have one more question. Before we get yeah. too far away, I want Ruder to tell the story of the uh of the Soviet ship because Ruder, you know this. I was in 24 back at the time, and we we're going, what's all this tarp stuff? And when you guys did that Soviet ship flight. You guys were in the spotlight and the heroes, and we're, you know, so. Got, got a lot of people excited at the time. Yeah, we, go ahead. We weren't tell- flying much at the time. We were supposed to have, what, three port calls in Australia, and then the Levi, uh, the barracks in Lebanon blew up, and so we were told to hang around the uh, 
<laughs> the Indian Ocean again a little bit longer, go up by other stuff. Yep. At the time, the Soviets had launched their newest carrier, which was the Nova Sisk. It, it had been launched like the year before, and it had come to the Pacific, and it was down off of, I believe it was Socotra Island. And where we were hanging around uh, on the Ranger was a thousand miles away. And so they came to us and they said, okay, uh, we want you to go down there and take some pictures of it. And at the time, uh, you know, I guess I was the more senior TARPS guy for experience. Uh, it was my second deployment. And so I got Kevin Saxon, who I was uh, with. And so we set this up to fly a thousand miles. Uh, and so it's a thousand miles there, 15 minutes of taking pictures and a thousand miles back. So we needed some tanking and there was no, uh, non-organic tanking available. So we had three KA6s or A6s with buddy stores. Uh, and we had a spare F-14. We all launch off. We were the only mission of the day. There was a EA-3 that launched off ahead of us and they were much faster than we are, which you didn't realize in crews. And so we basically, um, at 200 miles, the one KA-6 topped off the other two. And then uh, at about 400 miles, uh, we topped off and the A-6 is topped off. And uh, and then we were good to go. I think uh, we went out to 600 miles and we uh, topped off at the last uh, KA-6 who turned around and went home. Uh, so we continued flying out there. Uh, I thought it you know, might be trouble out in the middle of the big ocean to find this big ship and its escorts. Uh, wasn't that big of a trouble because one of the escorts was a Kinda cruiser. And when it locked on to us with its SAN3 system, we just had to follow our ALR4550 stroke <laughs> into, into the battle. <laughs> so, so we descended down and um, they also launched a couple of Yak-36s to intercept us. Uh, and then for some reason they turned around and went back. And so we went down. So one of our first passes, we flew, uh, probably 500 feet to a thousand feet over the top of a Yak 36 as it was making an approach to the, uh, Nova assist. And that got people excited because it was the first time they'd seen pictures of inside the cockpit. So, uh, and then we flew sometimes around it. Like I said, they knew we were there. You know, they we'd have the little strobes on the AOR 45, our uh, radar warning receiver. Uh, you'd see the ADGM uh, 30s. Uh, their failing system would be tracking you as you're flying along the ship. And so we did that for about 15 minutes while the EA3 was collecting ELINT. And then we headed back. And so it was, I think, almost a, it was like seven hour mission is what it turned into. Uh, we got back. It was supposed to be ready deck. Of course, this was the Ranger, and so that was a <laughs> <laughs> that, that wasn't quite true. When we got back, we were a little low on gas, but we had planned it so we'd you know be there at uh, you know about two thousand pounds left. So we got there, and they said, "Well, your signal is to hold overhead." <laughs> <laughs> the, the, I know Al was involved in others that once we trapped and they got that film out of there, there was a lot of activity going on. And, and the better TARPS crews, as I found and the way I trained them, is that you want to go there and you want to see the film when it first comes out because it helps you critique yourself about where you were and stuff. And we had some pretty good imagery of that, of running, whether it was the Ad 5, of where the hot spots on the deck of the Nova Assist, of uh, the 99 of whether it was directly overhead or if it was an oblique shot in the 87 also. Uh, and especially the uh, 87, I think, is what we use looking down into the uh, uh, Yak 36 Forger and the 99. So Al was there. There were a lot of people in the, uh, uh, we had ISs in the squadron. So we had more troopers than a regular intelligence specialist. Squadron. Yeah, yeah intelligence specialists. Specialist. And there were some that were trained for, uh, uh, looking at photos, basically, of doing that. And, but Al remembers, I don't think there was uh, any free space in the uh, lab at the time. Where, uh, there, there yeah, were, it got crowded. Yeah, and, you know, the admiral comes in and, you know, captain of the ship and all that. And so, and, and then we uh, debriefed it. But that was probably the most exciting mission I had, that people were, uh, it got a lot of attention. It, you know, it, I, I do want to say that people don't realize when the TARPS concept came out, TARP squadrons were supposed to get extra air crew and they were supposed to get extra money for training. 
Well, we all know how that went. <laughs> I mean, we had extra troopers, we had air crew that were trained, and now we had, you know, you have your sort, your status of resources and training, and the TARPS guys were supposed to have a minimum amount of training. Well, that wasn't fair because we were going to get more flight hours than others. And so, I mean, that's just how it went. And so it, it did work that way out. And when Southern Watch started, because I was uh, one of the designated TARPS crews, so I flew more because they were worried about what we were getting for imagery. And we got some pretty sad stuff there of what Saddam was doing to the people in the Delta. Uh, but so I ended up flying more than probably a lot of my peers there. But overall, most people, as we ended up cross-pollinating, so everybody got TARPS called, so nobody got upset that they weren't flying you know, all the missions available. So. Hey, yeah. Hey, so Ruder, you brought up an interesting point here. So you mentioned, uh, you're talking about the actual mission and how you used it. And we kind of have glossed right over what I think is a pretty big point. And that's from the point where you trap, you get yeah. chocked and chained in the flight deck and somewhere in there, the film has to get pulled out, brought down by Kodak's team and developed before it's handed to the ISs. So Al, can you talk us through how does, what's the mechanics of that? How did that work? How do you prevent exposure? Tell us about the dark room. Okay. Well, <clears throat> the KS-87 had two uh, cassettes on top of uh, the camera. One was a supply, one was a take up. So it, it was very simple to disconnect it take off the take-up reel. Uh, there was no problem. I mean, you exposed maybe six inches of, of film, but but that, the Rio was always supposed to take some photos after he was done. So you didn't lose any imagery because there was wasted imagery anyway. The KA-99, same thing, a little more difficult because it was a bigger magazine, but it basically, you swung it up, cut it, took it off, the Ad 5 had a magazine uh, in it that you dropped it on it. It had a little cage in there, and it came out. It didn't have a take. You, you brought that whole thing down to Civic. Now, <clears throat> they talk about you had a little pass-through down at Civic. That's true, but that was very seldom used. The only time that was used was during general quarters. Uh -huh. it, it would prevent the guys didn't have to go through another watertight door. Gotcha. Okay, so they I didn't know that's what that was for because I I yeah. was like ah, I assume it prevents light from no. getting in the dark room. No. Uh, so anyway, so so basically they they come in through the front door of Civic, bring the bring it back to us, you know. Gotcha. And and, and there we go. And how long would it take you to like develop a, a mission? Like you got the film sitting well, in front you of you. Had these? Uh, they, they used to piss me off. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I appear that I have asked a, t a sensitive question. Everybody was racing to how quick can we get an image processed from taking it out of the pod to getting it processed and handing it to an IS. I told my guys, if I catch anybody running through a passageway with a film canister, I'll bust your ass. I don't care how long it takes you to get it down there. You get it down there. We'll process it and we'll hand it. I am not into this seven minutes, I think someone says was a record. I, I could care less. What's the difference between seven minutes and 12 minutes? Nothing. That's still pretty fast. Twelve yeah, minutes is fast. It, is. <laughs> yeah. it goes. It was very fast. I mean, I remember yeah. going post mission. Post mission, we would go down to the light table in Civic, and we would help find the targets. Yeah. And, Usually, uh, by the time you debrief maintenance and you yeah. debrief the flight, you know that was you know twenty minutes. Absolutely. You go down. You go down to Civic, and it's on the light table. Yeah. Film That's right. The processor at about twenty feet a minute. Okay, and it took about. Two and a half minutes to, from the when you put it in the front end, in the dark end, I should say, of the uh, EH38 processor, till it came out, and you took it up on the reel, and you you could see because we had uh, lights at the end of the processors, so as the film came off, came down, and was rounding, you know, winding up, you could look at the film. 
Uh, so, me, you know. yeah. With, now, were the were the were the cameras really reliable? Like, I mean, you might have this like high uh, high visibility mission. Yep. You send off one airplane, the other yep. one goes down, or whatever. I mean, are you confident you're going to get the images? Yeah, the the problem existed in high humidity situations on the deck because the pod got its ECS that came down through the nose cone from the aircraft. You're talking about the cooling for the pod. Yeah, and it was yeah. cold, 39 degree. And it just was cold all the way because the heaters were not enabled on deck. You needed wheels up. So sometimes if I had a mission like the Novorossiysk, you'd tell the guys, hey, don't take the chance on running these cameras when we have just dumped 39 degree air all over it in a hundred and something degree outside temperatures. Get airborne. Then do your checks. So don't test them on deck. Yeah, okay. Right. Right. From a mission planning perspective, you know, we would have, we did deny flight Bosnia and Southern Watch, both my cruises, and it was, uh, you'd get a list of the 14 targets on your ATO and design your mission or design your, your route. But we always went with two Tomcats, two Tomcats tarps, so that you had redundancy and you just, you didn't miss targets because they were all, it was high visibility. If, if you missed targets, you heard about it, so. Interesting. Yeah. Between That's the two true. of us, we always got them. Okay, so I, let's. The only time I remember the anything failing in the pod was off Nicaragua when we first ran into the real high humidity environment. Yep. Yeah. So that was okay. Nicaragua was 1983 when the Ranger was on the cover of Newsweek magazine. Yeah. yeah. Ronald Reagan's <laughs> gunboat diplomacy. You guys yeah. flew tarps over Nicaragua, Ritter? We, we yeah. flew tarps on the ships that were off Nicaragua. Okay, yeah. got it. So the crunch, those were exciting days, man. We came out of San Diego and secret, no notice, turn left turn and went down to Central America for a month and a half. Oh, that's cool. Roughly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it cool. was yeah. boring. <laughs> After that left <laughs> turn, then it was boring. That sounds like no. exciting. Yeah. I mean, see, anything that you say secret mission, I'm like, yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> no, it's, it, okay. So you guys, have already, you guys already talked about we had intelligence specialists to analyze the film, and then the air crew sometimes went in and, and looked at it also. I, so I do it every time. Okay. Every time. I just, yeah, every time just to see what was happening. And that's actually where I learned the most with Al looking over my shoulder, kicking me a lot about, you know, why does this look like electricity on the film? Well, you had static electricity. And we saw that with dryer uh, sheets, basically. Or, or why does this look like there's a bright spot on the corner of the film? Well, we determined there was a light leak in on the canister. And that served me well later on because I ran into every one of those problems later on in other squadrons. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of the newer guys had never seen that, including the uh, photo officers, the warrants. Yeah, so, interesting. Okay, yeah, that's so, cool. So Same. let's move on to also talk about how the intel was used. I mean, for so Ruder, your your shots of the Nova Sisk, I mean, that was like almost strategic intel at, yes. at that time. But most of the, it was tactical. So you guys both flew in uh, Southern Watch. Uh, Santa, let's start with you. What what were what were you doing with the photos that you took uh, in Southern Watch and other places? Almost all for uh, Southern Watch and Deny Flight was just updating target photos. So we'd get a list of targets, update the photo, and then I think they'd put it on the Intel server, and that was you know beyond me. But uh, uh, and the digital tarp stuff was was different. That was different types of targets. That was more of something they wanted updated, you know, check out the capability, but also something that hey, let's update this as part of a different kind of tarps mission to, to update this during the battle or you know whatever was going on. I mean, that was one of those things that, you know, I was the TARPS officer during the 91 war until I went to 154 and went to Southern Watch. And TARPS was important then because they'd see movement of Iraqi, uh, uh, you know, troops, vehicles 
and the tarps guys saw it and they picked it up and yet because you didn't have that all you could do is voice till you got back and they looked at it and so that's where they were very big on they wanted a quick turnaround to see what the guys were doing uh, at the beginning of southern watch uh, like i said saddam was you know we thought that the delta people were going to rise up and overthrow saddam it didn't quite work that way and so we were taking stuff day and night because he was lining up basically a bulldozer next to a tank, next to a bulldozer, next to a tank. And he was just driving into the Delta, destroying it, you know, the, uh, destroying the environment there while shooting anybody that popped up. And so we took pictures of that too. And that, you know, that became important, I guess, in a strategic uh, method of saying, look, Saddam's not a nice guy. So, and, and we'd see firefights and you don't know necessarily if they were shooting at you or somebody else, especially at night where you'd see these, you know, uh, glowing golf balls come up in the air. Uh, but we were high enough. It was never a, you know, issue for us. But that was a big thing too. And updating target folders about, you know, what are they doing at this airfield now that, you know, we had bombed the heck out of, uh, you know, six months prior. So, well, you know, strike mission planning with the target folders here. We're trying to hit this oil refinery. Yeah. Let's pick aim points. Let's, uh, you know, look at yeah. look at what it's going to look like when you pull up your lantern pod. So that's that was the main thing that we were doing with it. And I, I saw that. I mean, when I went through in 97 and 98 Southern Watch, we had you were in 32, you say, Santa? Yep. Yeah, we had we had a lot of and Ruder, we had 154. Uh, target pictures too even you know i don't remember when the last time you were there but we had and then you know we looked at the target folders of you know communications relay stations antennas and all these other whatever you'd be as targets and then 211 since we had tarps we would update the target folders if we had it came up with a better picture so we'd use it both ways you know for they'd always have the picture they put your squadron emblem on it and then you're the crew's name before they uploaded it so it was uh, exactly <laughs> that's right that's yeah. right okay so let's go back to the old days ruder <laughs> ruder well, I, don't I mean know i don't remember back that far i was there too no tell us about the uh recce derbies uh because i remember hearing about that also i i remember tomcats yeah. uh competing against rf4s and uh, other platforms were you involved in some of those I was, went to three of them. Uh, we had, uh, it was interesting, we had the Brits come over with Jaguars. Uh, you had the Australians with uh, RF-111s. Uh, the Germans came with RF-4s. But the first one that I went to, I, I believe it was 84, the summer of 84. 86. Uh, BF-211. What was it? 86. No, we did one when I was in 80, and, uh, 84 because it was up in Fallon. Oh, that was, hey, that wasn't a recce derby. Okay. okay, what did they call that? I don't remember. I don't know what they call that. <laughs> the recce derbies were all down at Bergstrom. Yeah, and I did two of those. But they had one in uh, ninety. Yeah, the Navy sponsored something similar in '84 at Fallon, and we still had Australians there. And the big thing I remember about them is their C-130 lands, and the first thing you see coming off is pallets of Foster beer. <laughs> 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 Gotta love them. And, uh, but anyway, VF 211 got second place on that one. And then the Air Force said they would host them at Bergstrom, which was the home of their RF 4s. And so I went to that when I was a uh, RAG instructor. And uh, they got caught cheating, not us, but them. <laughs> but, Sounds like the Air Force. Yeah, it, Air Force? Yeah. It, it, basically, they had target folders for every low-level route in the area and all significant targets. So they had a huge advantage when they went out where we'd go out and we all we had was the chart. You know, so they had pictures of what things looked like. But anyway, we didn't do as well there uh, compared to others. Uh, I uh, uh, There's a famous, uh, from that rally, if you look up uh, F-14 refueling accidents... There's a camouflaged F-14, and I was in the back of it where we tanked off a KC-10 and hit the, uh, they say we hit it a little hard, but it was no harder than I remember hitting a, uh, like, KA-6 or anything. And it sent a sine wave up the hose, and it came back, ripped off the hose, dumped raw gas in our right intake, and blew up our right engine. I've seen that video. That's you? That's me in the back seat. Chris Quinn is in the front seat. All right. Yeah, that was, that was a fun time. <laughs> because 
the ramps, it, it disintegrated, I think, the number two ramp. And so the other ramps fell down in front of the engine. So you didn't have any windmilling or anything. That's the air um, inlet ramps for the audience, yeah, the, yeah, the ramps they, in, the, in the intake, yeah, like you said. You have three of them, but they come down like this to, uh, so you can go supersonic. Uh, and so we limped back the Bergstrom, and when we landed, you, you know, you look in the tail cone, and there looked like you could just have pieces of metal you could just pick up with your hand. You could see all the way through the engine. So, but anyway, uh, we did okay until that point. And then the last one I did was I was at ComFit, so I think it was 88. So that was 86. I was a rag instructor, and then 88 or 89 was the next one. And I was the ComFit TARPS officer, so I was the uh, OIC of that one. Uh, and that's where we had F-14Bs for the first time. So I got called in Bs, too, because of uh, instructing. Uh, and, uh, again, we didn't do as well as those who did reconnaissance day in and day out. I mean, for us, reconnaissance was a collateral duty, basically. So, but uh, they were interested. That's where I met Dave Parsons at one of those and, you know, and other things. So uh, I don't think the Air Force knew what to think of Navy guys. We had Tom Joyce with us in 86. And for those who know Tom, he's now a pastor. But he wanted to get beer cans, empty them out and put water in them and have us walk out to the plains and, you know, take a swig out of the beer can, crush it and throw it on the ramp. <laughs> Tom was a jokester. <laughs> we didn't that do it. Larry been... Rice was on that one. He went on to flag, and I had Chris Quinn in my front seat. So, oh god, that's funny. Yeah, so you guys gave, you know, a, <laughs> gave a good accounting of the Navy. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, we had other things. The one other story from that was the uh, reserves came in from Dallas, and they came in in a three plane. And when they came in at the break, they had, you know, the left guy broke left, the right guy broke right, and the lead guy broke up. And I was standing there with this Air Force colonel, and the uh, German guy was next to me, and the colonel goes, what sort of break is that? And the German, in his heavy accent, oh, sir, that's the FU Air Force Navy break. (laughs) 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 Okay, that was it. That's about right. (laughs) <laughs> That's about right. Cool. Hey, so, um, so Santa, I, I, I do want to have this circle back. So we were talking about DI tarps and, and you know, the, all the, for everybody that's digital tarps. So, uh, we we're talking about the digital tarp stuff and I feel like we, we hit on anything. Did, was there anything we missed on the digital piece? Cause we. No, I don't think so. I mean, it was a pretty simple system and I, I think, uh, that just led on to some of the, the TARP CD, which I wasn't involved with. I don't know. If, I think that was just a bigger hard drive for storage of that thing. And then um, went on to a Rover, which I, I was not a part of. And I just think that was a, had nothing to do with TARPs. It was just a capability to, to downlink your, your FLIR video to uh, ground troops. And right. Yeah. So, so for everybody, so Rover was the remote operated, Wow, video enhanced receiver. I think it was what it stand for, something like that. But it was uh, <laughs> it was one of those off the shelf things that we grabbed an antenna, strapped it on the bottom of the airplane, and it was this little tiny antenna. It was about three or four inches long, and it was really fragile. And it got to the point where we would like wrap it up and and like put like foam on it during pre-flight because people would hit it with their their uh the back of their flight gear or somebody's cranial and you'd snap the thing off and then you'd be like oh no we just broke a rover antenna <laughs> and it became like this uh it, what it was it was it allowed you to do real-time downlink of anything on your screen with ground troops and so we were using that in iraq quite a bit and i remember when we were prepping for this i was thinking hey i, I wonder if we were able to do I remember you know where you were talking about sending DI tarps pictures and I was thinking do we do that through rover and I think the answer was no because the time's off you know because rover was 2005 2006 and DI tarps was 10 years earlier so uh, yeah I lose track you know it's been a couple of years since then I forget but uh, rover yeah, was cool thing tarp CD I don't remember refresh me on tarp CD I just think it was a added uh like a bigger hard drive in the pod. I, I'm not really sure exactly how that worked, but it just, you, know, you could store video from the Polnix camera as opposed to, you know, just a single shot. Ah, interesting. Oh, okay. Cause I remember at one point it went to a PCM CIA card. Was that TARP CD? That was, uh, yeah, that was ours. The PCI, you know, that was way, way back, not very much storage capability. And that's what all the pictures in our day, in my day, 
uh, yeah. were captured on, and then you could pull that out. So you'd have the pictures afterward, even the ones you didn't choose to send over the radio. All right. Okay. And where was that card? Was that in the pod or was that in the cockpit? No, that was in the pod. It was in the pod. Yeah, you'd have to pull that out of the pod. Right near, I'm sure it was right near the Polnix camera there in the in Bay 1. Yeah. Gotcha. Things I don't remember because, uh, you know. Now, it's interesting how they made those incremental okay. uh, and technical improvements, but they helped. You know, they made the system more useful. Various reasons. Yeah, yeah it's great hey, stuff. Like I say, we started out with four pods. I think we ended up with 46 total. Oh, that's good. That's good perspective. 48. 48 total. And from what I remember, because I was asked that at ComFit, is we never lost one. We lost tarps airplanes, but we never lost a pod. Wow. But I don't remember. Unless, Al, do you remember any? I, I believe we lost one in uh, 211. No, no, that was, I was on the tarps airplane and you guys had downloaded the pod. That was my accident that I left it in the ocean. So. Oh. <laughs> it, didn't it have a pod on it? No, sir. It did not have a pod on it that night. So. All right. Mm. Al doesn't believe you. I can see it on his face. <laughs> yeah, he, he's, he's called me a liar my whole career. He, he's he's good. the fire. <laughs> what? That was, the, was fire. the fire. The what fire was at that time, the, the only time I had a pod fire was in 154, and that's when they had the heating elements were bad. But uh, back then, the fire came from a leak uh, from the wing pivot, they think, and it surrounded the right engine and then lit off. So it was seen from 50 miles away by a contract Learjet. It said he had a flaming meteorite on the nose. You know, that's no flaming meteorite. That's me. So, <laughs> okay. so what did your wingman, what did your wingman say to you, Reuter? Uh, oh, the wingman said, said, you're either an afterburner or you're on fire. <laughs> <laughs> So, and but so we were supersonic when we got the fire. And so, what did um, Flex? What did Flex say? Um, Flex? Flex he said, very, he, yeah, my pilot was a guy named Jim DeStaffney. He Flex. said, "I'm not an afterburner, right?" Or something yeah. like that. <laughs> and, and the other thing they had on that is, you know, we slowed down, but we were supersonic above thirty thousand. We were about twenty three thousand two ninety indicated when we hit the fire extinguishers, and that's when the fire lit off behind us. And that's when the wingman came out and said, you're either an afterburner, or you're on fire. He was trying to join on us. And it was right after that, that, you know, Flex said to me, we got to, you know, get out of here. And I looked to the right and we did the eject, eject, eject and punched out. The fire was blue, white flames right next to us. It was no doubt in anybody's professional mind that the airplane was on fire. <laughs> it was not a good night. <laughs> September 4th, 1984. Wow. So and you're here to I, tell about it. Cool. Yeah, I'm here to tell about it. Well, you know, as I got injured on the ejection, so did Flex. So uh, I have a, a torn ligaments in my back because of the ejection. So that's stayed with me the rest of my career, even in my life now. But I'm alive. You know, the seat works. After that, I, when I went to be a rag instructor, I became also an expert on the ejection seat. <laughs> Comes so, with the territory, yeah. Yeah. So you know that, but that's, yeah, I, I remember that, Al, that, uh, you know, I know that we didn't have a pod on it because we were just going to go out and burn fuel and come back. So okay. I'd have to look up the uh, Euro number, but I also know it was, I think, the newest airplane we had. It, <laughs> we had course. just gotten it a few months before, and I don't know if there was a warranty on those things. <laughs> so but, uh, so and I remember the date well because I got engaged the night before to my current wife. Uh, <laughs> Crunch, this is kind of a bonus, a little ejection story at the end of the show. Huh? What do you it think? Is. Yeah. It yeah. is. But, and the other thing but, I noticed on, in my uh, logbook, it talks about where we went. It was uh, NKX, which is the designator for Miramar to Ocean. Yes, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> somebody wrote in my logbook, so I figured, ocean. funny, funny guys. So I guess I have a sea landing then, right? Because, yep. you know, the, the sea pan's still part of it. Yep. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, let's see, it was 161165 was the uh, bureau number. Okay, 161165. That was the one that, that Reuter jumped out of. I jumped out of 159623. Santa, you have an ejection? <laughs> no, I did not. Have <laughs> no, sir. Kodak, I know you don't have one, so yeah. I don't think. <laughs> no. Okay, you know what? 
You guys, we have covered everything that we wanted to talk about in TARPs and more. You guys brought in uh, interesting little facts and the perspective that we were hoping for. We described the whole process. We described what the flights are like, et cetera. So, I mean, is anybody, can anybody think of one last thing they were hoping we would ask about or, uh, or that you want to tell? So let's, you know, Ruder, you got anything? One more I, I just want to publicly thank Kodak is that we wouldn't have had TARPs if it hadn't been for him. And what we learned in the first deployments and later on when I was a TARPs officer, what we kept learning, I mean, after the initial five years when we figured out this thing's going to be around a bit longer than we thought, and Al was at Nav Air, and without his help at Nav Air, and I was at ComFit pushing stuff, is, uh, I mean, there wasn't money really set aside for improving TARPs. I mean, it was supposed to be gone. It was supposed to go to the uh, F-18. It was supposed to get their Advanced Tactical Air Reconnaissance System, ATARs. And that was supposed to fit up in the nose where the gun was. And that kept getting pushed and pushed and pushed. And as you know, we had tarps until the very end of the Tomcat. So uh, it, it worked there. People don't realize, and we didn't really mention, is that to fly tarps, you had to have counterweight in the forward uh, missile rail. So you either had two dummy sparrows. Oh, good point. 500 pounds each. Or you had two Phoenix rails, which is what you had most of the time on deployment. So you had another thousand pounds there. And there were a lot of people in early TARPs, the uh, pilots in Rios, who didn't want to do it. They thought it was, you know, made you a second class citizen. And yet by the 91 war, they realized that this is probably one of the missions you want to be involved with. It was exciting and to do stuff there. So I'm glad I sort of got pushed into it, and I, I enjoyed it my whole time. I flew it for all 13 years in the Tomcat. I flew tarps. All right. Well, hey, uh, everybody. Hey, thank, thank, gentlemen. Thank you for coming on. This has been a, a great discussion. I really appreciate it. I have certainly learned something. Uh, you know, Al, I could tell that you are a fountain of knowledge. That uh, you were just spouting stuff off there through this whole discussion. That I'm like, wow, that's. He, he knows a lot of stuff there. He, you know, it was really good. So, and uh, it's been, it's been great. Ruder, Santa, it's great having both of you guys on. I appreciate the, the experience you. that we guys bring to this and the discussion where we talk about everything from the very beginning all the way to the very end with the implementation of the digital system. So everybody, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for joining the F-14 Tomcast. Wow, that was great. I loved how Kodak provided a lot of background that you normally wouldn't get if you were just talking to aviators. It was also really interesting to hear about how technology changed over the years. Yeah, I agree, Bio. You know, it's, I, I always love hearing flying stories like from Ruder and Santa there, but I, I enjoyed hearing from Kodak talk about the film processing and the professionalism of the people who are behind the scenes. Really reflects on the professionalism of every, everybody who's involved in naval aviation. Be sure to come back for our next episode, F-14D Combat Systems with Commander Fun Malay. Yeah.